Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Wilma. Reverend Ed is away today. He'll be back tomorrow. This past week he was on his study leave. Welcome to the Oak Ridge Presbyterian Church online service. We're so glad that you can join us. And we want to wish all of the fathers and father figures out there a happy Father's Day. Before we begin our service, there are a few announcements. Next week is the last week that Dave Buckley will be leading music ministry here at Oak Ridge. Dave, Anka, and the entire family have been such a great blessing in our church for music, for all ages, but also in social venues and so many other ways. If you still wish to send uh, wishes, memories, pictures, please email them to me. And if you'd like to contribute to the gift fund, then just contact the office by Tuesday. The Roth Home Family Shelter is looking after 50 families. They are in need of personal supplies, shampoo, sunscreen, craft supplies, reusable water bottles, and other personal care items. These are for their day camps. They would also like donations of used bedding, sheets, blankets, towels, cutlery, pots, pans, and cookie sheets needed for setting up people in their own accommodations. Donations can be taken to Rothholm Family Shelter at 42 Stanley Street. Phone 519-673-4114. Thank you for supporting this worthwhile service. Hear the call from God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please join us in our opening praise song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. And then we will hear from our music ministry leader and coordinator, Sonia Brule, who will tell us what's happening in kids' ministry this week. Father's Day. 
Now this week in Kidsmen, we are digging into the armor of God, in particular the helmet of salvation. So check out our Kidsmen video on our YouTube channel. Now please feel free to join us in our next hymn, Oceans. join me in our call to worship. We come to worship you, Lord God, for you are great and do wondrous things. Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us an undivided heart to revere your name. We give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart, and we will glorify your name forever. Come, let us worship God together. At this time, the triple chord chorus will sing Jacob's Ladder, and the Oak Ridge Chancel Choir will sing, Then Sings My Soul, How Great Thou Art.
Please join me for our prayer of adoration and confession. God of grace, you created our minds to grow in wisdom. You created our hearts to expand with love for you and your world. You created our voices to sing your praises forever. Fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, so we may worship you in spirit and in truth bold and unafraid to follow you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God who creates the future, you call us to follow you, yet we confess we prefer to remain where we are. You offer us new beginnings, yet we continue to make the same familiar choices. You invite us into the fullness of life, yet we distance ourselves from you and each other, through fear and doubt. Forgive us, O God. Cleanse us from every unworthy thought, word, and deed. With the grace of Christ our Lord. Rouse us by the Spirit to be intentional, courageous disciples, even when the world does not welcome us, or the word we proclaim in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us say the declaration of forgiveness together. In Christ, we are made a new creation. The old life is gone and the new life has come. Know that God loves you and forgives you. Do not be afraid to make a new start. PC. I'm Jeff. I'm the Youth and Young Adult Minister here, and I just have a couple of quick announcements before we get started on our scripture reading for today. Firstly, after the service today, you can click over on our YouTube page and find our youth lesson. Uh, we're studying the life of Joseph, and uh, last week we looked at the pit that he ended up in and realized that God was still there with him. So join us again this week as we continue to look at his life and what it means to be um, a follower of God through the lens of, of his life and his uh, circumstances. And uh, we also have, uh, next week we're having a, a graduation ceremony a, uh, within the service here. We will be having a, a short 
portion of it that will be celebrating our grads. So uh, I've said it a couple times before, I don't want to sound too much like a broken record, but if you or someone you know is graduating from elementary school uh, out of grade 8, from secondary school out of grade 12, or from post-secondary education, please let me know so that we can uh, have them recognized in, in that format. We will also at 11.30 today, and every Sunday we will be having a young adults meeting. Um, we've been studying the book of Acts. This week we are looking at Acts chapter 9. Feel free to reach out to me so that we can get you the Zoom link for that. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time, it's a good chance to study the early church and the way that they did things and how that affects us today. Uh, this week we're actually, if you're familiar with Acts ch chapter 9, we're looking at the conversion of Saul. So it'll be a good week, it'll be inter in an interesting week. And lastly, uh, every Wednesday night on Zoom at 6.30, we have our youth group meeting. We are meeting to uh, connect, reconnect, make sure we're, we're staying together in amidst the distance, but also we are studying the book of Revelation. Uh, a number of our members were interested in looking at that that book. Um, and so we're, we're taking a look at that with uh, a lens on application and having a, a, a well-rounded view of what that book is. So that's kind of what we've got, got going on. I will head now and if you can join me now for our prayer for illumination. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, O God. Break down our defenses and change our hearts so that we may fully accept and follow the mission you lay out for your church every day, today, and forevermore. Amen. Our scripture reading for this week will be from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 21, followed by a reading from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. Uh, you can turn with me now to Genesis 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his, of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of this boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in her skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not look, do not let me look on the death of the child. And she, as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin of water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. If you can turn with me now to Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, 
how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear for those who kill the body. Sorry, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soil, soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before me, before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. An open door. In November of 2012, I was in school learning how to preach. One of the methods we studied was from a text called The Four Pages of the Sermon, and our, our professor, Dr. Jeff Crittenden, has in, had invited the author of the book, Paul Scott Wilson, to our class as a guest speaker. In its simplest form, the idea is to find trouble and grace in the biblical text. In other words, if the scripture reading makes you feel down, it is likely trouble. And if it makes you feel hopeful, it is grace. Trouble puts the burden on us to do something. Grace puts the burden on God. I tell you this because I was really struggling with the texts for this week. I was stuck in trouble and couldn't see grace. And one of the things Dr. Wilson said was, if you can't talk about trouble and grace, you can't speak about who God is and what God does, or God's mission, missio Dei, which is to bless. I believe the nature of God is love. God values and treasures life. I needed to find an open door. When I first read that story of Hagar and Ishmael, I thought, how awful. This is just brutal, sending her away into the wilderness with bread and water and her son. It wasn't her choice to have a child with Abraham. She was a slave. Sarah made her do it. And what about Abraham? How could God tell him to listen to his jealous wife and kick them out? would your reaction to the story be about Hagar and Ishmael being sent away just out into a desert into the wide open would you th think in disgust of Abraham and how he listened to Sarah or maybe disbelief that God said to Abraham do as Sarah told you it seems totally unfair I mean Sarah's disbelief was what got Hagar pregnant in the first place. Sarah gave her to Abraham as a way of indirectly making sure Abraham had an heir. She wanted to help God with God's plan to make sure Abraham was a father of many nations. So I had to go back in, in the book of Genesis a little bit earlier to see if Hagar had done something to Sarah. 
Hagar had run away once before when first she was pregnant. Sarah was treating her badly. And we're told in chapter 16 of Genesis that when Hagar became pregnant, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Not a good idea. She thought having Abram's child made her above Sarah, and Sarah would have none of that. When she ran away, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. So Hagar went back. And when her son was born, he had a father, Abraham, to teach him what he needed to know. But it couldn't have been a picnic for Hagar all this time as Sarah's slave. To Sarah, Hagar was nameless and so was Ishmael. But not to Abraham or to God. And Sarah was jealous of Hagar's and Ishmael's relationship with Abraham. This jealousy was a struggle between Hagar and Sarah ever since Ishmael's conception. And that's about 15 years when this text begins. You might think that Sarah would relax a bit when she becomes pregnant and Isaac is born and, and now the dangerous period after his birth is over and he is being weaned. God promised a miracle and he gave it. But at Isaac's weaning celebration, she loses it when she sees Ishmael and Isaac together. Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac, she says to Abraham. It isn't clear what Sarah saw in their plane together, but she made it clear to Abraham that the nameless ones had no place in their home. It seems a bit extreme, not to mention unjust, and Abraham was quite upset. Ishmael had been his only son for 14 years. He would have taught him life skills. He would have taught him about God. They had bonded. So why would God tell Abraham to listen to Sarah and make them go? I was having trouble finding God's grace in all of this. And maybe it was because all I could see was trouble in the world. Because almost all the news has been bad. And life seems to unravel daily, and it's hard to see God's grace. In the larger picture, there is COVID-19, black matters, and all of the violence around that. Injustices surrounding indigenous peoples come close to home. World poverty, and what seem to be costly political chess games. And then there are daily struggles people live with in terms of health and employment and economic struggles, challenges of homeschooling, lack of ability to help loved ones, and a whole host of other things that seem to chip away at hope on a daily basis. So I opened the front door, something we haven't done as quickly these past months, and I walked out to the car. I felt God pointing me in the direction of Park Hill to visit Dave and Nancy, socially distanced, of course. And among other things, they gave me a few movies I had missed at Faith at the Flicks. Over the next couple of days, I watched those movies. One of them in particular was called Walking Across Egypt, and it turned on the light in the attic. Isn't it interesting that it's called Walking Across Egypt when Hagar is an Egyptian? It was as if God was pointing to something. Look, do you see what's happening in this movie? It's like that. I get it. I get it. There's a lady named Maddie Rigsby in the movie. She's elderly and her children don't like her living on her own. They think she should go to a retirement home, 
but she likes being there. Actually, her daughter wants her to go more than her son. And this stray dog just happens to park himself on her porch. And of course, Maddie, seeing the poor dog is hungry, has to feed it. But she says to her son, I have no business at my age keeping a stray dog any more than I have business walking across Egypt. Yes. And so she calls the dog catcher to come and get it. And in the meantime, before the dog catcher gets there, she gets stuck in her rocking chair because she had sent the seat of the chair away to be repaired and she forgot. When she turned on the soap opera and backed into the chair to sit down, she went plop. And she could not get out for about three hours until the dog catcher arrived. He gets her free and so begins their friendship. His name is Lamar and he tells Maddie about his 16-year-old nephew in the young man's detention center. That poor young man is in there for stealing a car and no one can get him out because his parents didn't want him so they put him in an orphanage and took off. Maddie finds this very troubling, a child like that being behind bars. I wonder if Ishmael would have ended up behind bars like that. At church, she hears the minister talking about reaching out to those in need. It hit her in church that Wesley was one of the least of these. One of those that needed to have a visit, maybe some cake. And she took him some cake because she thought it would be like taking it to Jesus. And so she goes to visit him. Without giving away the whole story, Wesley runs away from the detention center, kind of like Hagar did from Sarah. And he goes to Maddie's. He tells her he is on leave for a few days, and so she gives him a place to stay. Maddie's kind of an interesting combo of the angel of the Lord to Hagar and maybe Abraham to Ishmael, because she teaches him good things like how to fish and swim and help around the house, how to be thankful and how to talk to God. She says, you just talk to God like a friend who just gave you something. Maddie discovers Wesley is taking things and confronts him. And her kids, of course, are fit to be tied about the relationship growing between her and Wesley. But when Maddie finds out that Wesley lied and he wasn't on leave, he actually escaped from the detention center, she tells him, like the angel of the Lord told Hagar, you have to go back. There are rules that have to be followed, you know. At school, we were taught to look for trouble in the Bible and then see how it matched up with trouble in the world when we were preaching. And then look for God's grace in the Bible and grace in the world. It always ends with God's grace. Well, as movies often do on the Family Channel, this one had a happy ending. Maddie made a discovery that showed her Wesley was one of the least of these that she should adopt as a grandchild. Her kids are against it. The church is against it. But Maddie wants to follow Jesus' lead. That rehab center is a pretty rough place for boys. And Wesley had told her that most of them, for most of them, it's just pre-penitentiary. Maddie ends up rescuing Wesley just in time. The door to the young men's rehab center is opened and he is free adopted by a grandma and Maddie treats him no longer like she would treat Jesus but as one of her own. God is with them. For me at that point it was as if God pointed to a spring of water like Hagar only my situation was way different than Hagar's. But there was encouragement and a good visit with friends, a blessing, a new perspective, hope, grace. Now I could see grace in the Bible. 
Maybe God was not happy with the way Hagar was treated. What if, in spite of the way things unfolded, it's really God's way of giving Hagar her freedom? She's no longer a slave girl. She's free. And her son will be the father of a nation. Hagar knows God as the one who sees. Perhaps God told Abraham to listen to Sarah because he wanted Hagar to be free. She would never be free as a slave of Sarah. She would even be nameless. Her son would remain nameless. But now Ishmael had 15 years with Abraham, his father, where he learned how to live, where he learned about God. When Abraham opens the door for Hagar to leave, she gets her freedom. And as much as it hurts, she has Ishmael to take care of her. He learns to be a man, and his mother finds him an Egyptian wife. So he, too, can become a nation, as God promised. God comes to Hagar and points to water and promises he is with her son. Hagar says again, God sees and we are told God heard the boy cry out. God is with them. In the gospel reading, Jesus tells his disciples, there will be trouble in this world. And these stories show us there is trouble. And what we live, we know there will be trouble. Jesus said, I had it, you will have it, but have no fear. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered. Nothing secret that will not become known. You will have conflict if you follow my lead, but God has a plan, and it is for good. He is with you. You are precious to him. So was Hagar, so was Ishmael, so was Maddie, so was Wesley. We are all precious to God. And there is an open door for us too, and God will direct us, just as he did with Hagar and Maddie. Who could we be mother or father, brother or sister, grandmother or grandfather to? John Ortberg wrote this, Mission began with God. God has a mission. That's why he made for himself a people. But his mission came before people. His mission came before the Bible. He gave his mission a Bible. He gave his mission a people. God's mission, God's project, is to bless. Open doors are an invitation to be part of the Missio Dei, the mission of God. All, th all glory be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Holy God, from you flow loving kindness, justice, and mercy. You bless us to be a blessing. Bless these gifts so that acts of kindness, justice, and mercy may flow from them too. And bless our lives so the world may see in us signs of your kingdom at work in the church and community. In Christ's name, amen. In our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession today, we would like to remember Barry Algy and family as they mourn the loss of Gail Algy. There was a private service yesterday, and it is, um, if you would like to watch it, it is on YouTube for the time being. Um, if you would like to watch it and you don't know where to find it, you could call the church office, and we'll see how we can get that hooked up. Pauline Snell is still in hospital, and we pray for her healing, as well as Jenny Wong, who is at home. We pray for her healing as well. So let's come to our God with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. At the end of it, we will pray the Lord's Prayer together using debtors. God, you are compassionate. You are strength and light, comfort and peace to us. We pray that you will embrace each situation we remember in our prayers today with your steadfast love. Thank you for moments of joy that still break into our lives, even in the strange times of pandemic and reopening of our communities. Thank you for love given and received and for friends who furnish our life with meaning and happiness, for family who embrace us with love and understanding. We give you special thanks today for all caring and faithful fathers celebrated today, remembering also those whose fathers have died and praying for those fathers cut off from their families. God of nations, we pray for our country and countries around this world that are so deeply affected by COVID-19. Guide leaders to make wise decisions about reopening communities and give patience and courage to those whose lives have been disrupted and especially those who fear what the future holds. Where there is injustice and misinformation confuses people, protect the vulnerable and shine light on your truth to reveal the path of justice and renewed hope. Compassionate God, we pray for peace to prevail where there is war and ask that respect for human life will grow wherever people are abused or scorned. We pray for those who suffer and all who mourn loss. Lord, we pray especially for Barry Algy and the Algy family as they mourn the loss of Gail. We pray, Lord, for Pauline Snell and for Jenny Wong. Will you give them healing, Lord? Will you bless them and hold them in your hands? 
Surround them all with your love and support, with strength of your spirit. Open our eyes to see how we might bring comfort to those who are hurting. Eternal God, you hold the dead as well as the living in your tender care, and thank you for people in every age who have entered into your heavenly presence, especially those dear to our hearts. And hear us now as we offer prayers, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As our final hymn of praise, we will sing, Be Thou My Vision. from Romans 15 verse 13. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as you go on your way, lift up your hearts. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. <laughs>